book five chapter six of history of the reformation in the sixteenth century volume two by jean henri mel d'aubigne translated by henry beveridge this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter six these theological discussions to which the worldly-minded of the present day would not devote a few short moments had been attended and listened to with eagerness during twenty days laymen knights and princes taking a deep interest in them to the last duke barnim and duke george seemed particularly attentive whereas some of the theologians of leipzig friends of dr epp slept as an eyewitness expresses it quite soundly it was even necessary to awake them on the adjournments that they might not lose their dinner luther was the first to quit leipzig and next karlstadt Eck remained several days after they were gone. No formal decision was given on the points discussed. Everyone spoke as he thought. There was at Leipzig, says Luther, loss of time and no investigation of the truth. During the two years in which we have been examining the doctrines of our opponents, we have counted all their bones. Eck, on the contrary, has hardly skimmed the surface, but he cried more in one hour than we did in two long years. Eck, when writing privately to his friends, admitted his defeat to a certain extent, though he was at no loss for an explanation. The Wittenbergers, wrote he to Hochstraten on the 24th of July, defeated me on several points, first because they brought books with them, secondly because they took down the debate in writing and examined it at home at their leisure and thirdly because they were more numerous two doctors karlstadt and luther lange vicar of the augustins two licentiates amsdorf and a very arrogant nephew of reuchlin melanchthon three doctors of law and several masters of arts lent their assistance both in public and private whereas i stood alone having nothing but a good cause for my companion eck forgot emser and all the doctors of leipzig though these concessions escaped eck in familiar correspondence he acted otherwise in public the doctor of ingolstadt and the theologians of leipzig made a great noise with what they called their victory they everywhere set false reports in circulation while all the tongues of the party reiterated their expressions of self-complacency. Eck goes about triumphing, wrote Luther. There were disputes, however, in the camp of Rome in regard to the laurels. Had we not come to the help of Eck, said the theologians of Leipzig, the illustrious doctor would have been overthrown. The theologians of Leipzig, said Eck on his part, are well enough, but I had hoped too much from them i did the whole myself you see said luther to spalatin how they are chanting a new iliad and a new enid they are kind enough to make me a hector or a turnus while eck is their achilles or aeneas their only doubt is whether the victory was gained by the arms of eck or by those of leipzig all i can say to throw light on the matter is that eck uniformly kept bawling and the Leipzigers, as uniformly, held their peace. Eck, says the elegant, clever, and sagacious Mosellanus, has triumphed in the estimation of those who do not understand the subject, and who have grown old in poring over the schoolmen, but in the estimation of all men of learning, intellect, and moderation, Luther and Karlstadt are the victors. The Leipzig discussion, however, was not destined to vanish into smoke. Every work which is devoutly performed bears fruit. The words of Luther had penetrated the minds of his hearers with irresistible force. Several of those who had daily thronged the castle hall were subdued by the truth, whose leading conquests were made among her most decided opponents even poliander the secretary familiar friend and disciple of eck was gained to the reformation and began in fifteen hundred and twenty two to preach the gospel at leipzig 
john camerarius professor of hebrew one of the keenest opponents of the reformation impressed by the words of the mighty teacher began to examine the holy scriptures more thoroughly and shortly after throwing up his situation came to wittemberg to study at the feet of luther he was afterwards pastor at frankfurt and dresden among those who had taken their place on the seats reserved for the court and accompanied duke george was george of anhalt a young prince twelve years of age of a family which had distinguished itself in the wars against the saracens at this time he was studying at leipzig with his tutor great ardour for science and a strong attachment to truth had already become the characteristics of the illustrious young prince he was often heard to repeat the words of solomon falsehood ill becomes a prince the leipzig discussion inspired this child with serious reflection and with a decided leaning to luther some time after a bishopric was offered to him his brother and all his family with the view of raising him to high honour in the church urged him to accept it but he resolutely declined his pious mother who was secretly favourable to luther having died he became possessed of all the reformer's writings he was constant and fervent in prayer to god to incline his heart to the truth and often in the solitude of his chamber exclaimed with tears deal mercifully with thy servant and teach me thy statutes his prayers were heard carried forward by his convictions he fearlessly joined the ranks of the friends of the gospel in vain did his guardians and particularly duke george beseech him with entreaties and remonstrances he remained inflexible and the duke half convinced by his pupil's reasons exclaimed i cannot answer him still however i will keep by my church i am too old a dog to be trained we will afterwards see in this amiable prince one of the finest characters of the reformation one who himself preached the word of life to his subjects and to whom the saying of dion respecting the emperor marcus antoninus has been applied he was through life consistent with himself he was a good man a man free from guile but luther's words met with an enthusiastic reception especially from the students they felt the difference between the spirit and life of the doctor of wittemberg and the sophistical distinctions and vain speculations of the chancellor of ingolstadt they saw luther founding upon the word of god and they saw dr eck founding only on human traditions the effect was soon visible the classes of the university of leipzig almost emptied after the discussion one circumstance partly contributed to this the plague threatened to make its appearance but there were many other universities for example erfurt or ingolstadt to which the students might have repaired the force of truth drew them to wittemberg where the number of students was doubled among those who removed from the one university to the other was a youth of sixteen of a melancholy air who spoke little and often amid the conversation and games of his fellow students seemed absorbed by his own thoughts his parents at first thought him of weak intellect but they soon found him so apt to learn and so completely engrossed by his studies that they conceived high hopes of him his integrity his candour his modesty and his piety made him a general favourite and mosellanus singled him out as a model to all the university he was called gaspard krusiger and was originally from leipzig this new student of wittemberg was afterward the friend of melanchthon and the assistant of luther in the translation of the bible the leipzig discussion produced results still more important inasmuch as the theologian of the reformation then received his call modest and silent melanchthon had been present at the discussion almost without taking any part in it till then his attention had been engrossed by literature but the discussion gave him a new impulse and gained him over to theology henceforth his science did homage to the word of god 
he received the evangelical truth with the simplicity of a child his audience heard him expound the doctrines of salvation with a grace and clearness by which all were charmed he boldly advanced in this which was to him a new career for said he christ will never leave his people from this moment the two friends walked side by side contending for liberty and truth the one with the energy of st paul and the other with the meekness of st john luther has admirably expressed the difference of their calling i was born said he to enter the field of battle and contend with factions and demons hence my writings breathe war and tempest i must root up the trunks remove the thorns and the brambles and fill up the marshes and pools i am the sturdy woodcutter who must clear the passage and level the ground but master philip advances calmly and softly he digs and plants sows and waters joyously in accordance with the gifts which god has with so liberal a hand bestowed upon him if melanchthon the quiet sower was called to the work by the discussion of leipzig luther the hardy woodcutter felt his arm strengthened and his courage still more inflamed by it the mightiest result of this discussion was produced in luther himself scholastic theology said he sunk entirely in my estimation under the triumphant presidency of dr eck in regard to the reformer the veil which the school and the church had hung up in front of the sanctuary was rent from top to bottom constrained to engage in new inquiries he arrived at unexpected discoveries with equal astonishment and indignation he saw the evil in all its magnitude while poring over the annals of the church he discovered that the supremacy of rome had no other origin than ambition on the one hand and credulous ignorance on the other the narrow point of view under which he had hitherto looked at the church was succeeded by one both clearer and wider in the christians of greece and the east he recognized true members of the catholic church and instead of a visible head seated on the banks of the tiber he adored as sole head of his people that invisible and eternal redeemer who according to his promise is always and in all parts of the world in the midst of those who believe in his name the latin church luther no longer regarded as the universal church the narrow barriers of rome were thrown down and he shouted for joy when he saw the glorious domain of jesus christ stretching far beyond them henceforth he felt that he could be a member of the church of christ without belonging to the church of the pope in particular the writings of john huss made a strong impression on him to his great surprise he discovered in them the doctrine of st paul and st augustine the doctrine to which he himself had arrived after so many struggles i believed said he and without knowing it taught all the doctrines of john huss so did Stapitz. in short without suspecting it we are all hussites as are also st paul and st augustine i am confounded at it and know not what to think oh what dreadful judgments have not men merited from god evangelical truth when unfolded and published more than a century ago was condemned burned and suppressed woe woe to the earth luther disengaged himself from the papacy regarding it with decided aversion and holy indignation all the witnesses who in every age had risen up against rome came successively before him to testify against her and unveil some of her abuses or errors o oh, darkness exclaimed he he was not allowed to be silent as to these sad discoveries the pride of his adversaries their pretended triumph and the efforts which they made to extinguish the light fixed his decision he advanced in the path in which god was leading him without any uneasiness as to the result luther has fixed upon this as the moment of his emancipation from the papal yoke 
learn by me said he how difficult it is to disencumber oneself of errors which the whole world confirms by its example and which from long habit have become a second nature for seven years i had been reading and with great zeal publicly expounding the holy scriptures so that i had them almost entirely by heart i had also all the rudiments of knowledge and faith in the lord jesus christ that is to say i knew that we were not justified and saved by our works but by faith in christ and i even maintained openly that the pope is not the head of the christian church by divine authority and yet i could not see the inference that certainly and necessarily the pope is of the devil for whatever is not of god must of necessity be of the devil further on luther adds i no longer vent my indignation against those who are still attached to the pope since i myself after reading the holy scriptures so carefully and for so many years still clung to the pope with so much obstinacy such were the true results of the discussion of leipzig results far more important than the discussion itself and resembling those first successes which discipline an army and inflame its courage end of book five chapter six book five chapter seven of history of the reformation in the sixteenth century volume two by jean henri mail d'aubigne translated by henry beveridge this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter seven Eck abandoned himself to all the intoxication of what he would fain have passed off as victory. He kept tearing at Luther, and heaped accusation upon accusation against him. He also wrote to Frederick. Like a skilful general, he wished to take advantage of the confusion which always succeeds a battle, in order to obtain important concessions from the prince preparatory to the steps which he meant to take against his opponent personally he invoked the flames against his writings even those of them which he had not read imploring the elector to convene a provincial council the coarse-minded doctor exclaimed let us exterminate all this vermin before they multiply out of measure luther was not the only person against whom he vented his rage he had the imprudence to call Melanchthon into the field. Melanchthon, who was in terms of the greatest intimacy with the excellent Echolampadius, gave him an account of the discussion, and spoke of Eck in eulogistic terms. Nevertheless, the pride of the Chancellor of Ingolstadt was offended, and he immediately took up the pen against this grammarian of Wittenberg, who, it is true, said he, was not ignorant of Latin and Greek, but had dared to publish a letter in which he had insulted him, Dr. Eck. Melanchthon replied, It is his first theological writing, and displays the exquisite urbanity which characterized this excellent man laying down the fundamental principles of hermeneutics he shows that the holy scriptures ought not to be explained according to the fathers but the fathers according to the holy scriptures how often says he did not jerome commit mistakes how often augustine how often ambrose how often do they differ in opinion how often do they retract their own errors there is only one volume inspired by the spirit of heaven pure and true throughout luther it is said does not follow some ambiguous expositions of the ancients and why should he follow them when he expounds the passage of st matthew thou art peter and upon this rock i will build my church he agrees with origen who by himself alone is worth a host with augustine in his homily and Ambrose in his sixth book on St. Luke, to say nothing of others. In what, then, you will say, do the fathers contradict each other? Is it surprising that they should? I believe in the fathers because I believe in the Holy Scriptures. The meaning of the Scripture is one, and simple, like heavenly truth herself. We arrive at it by comparing different passages together. 
we deduce it from the thread and connection of the discourse there is a philosophy enjoined us in regard to the book of god and it is to employ it as the touchstone by which all the opinions and maxims of men must be tried it was a long time since these great truths had been so elegantly expounded the word of god was restored to its proper place and the fathers to theirs the simple method by which we ascertain the meaning of scripture was distinctly traced the word had precedence over all the difficulties and the expositions of the school melancthon furnished the answer to those who like dr eck would envelop this subject in the mists of a remote antiquity the feeble grammarian had risen up and the broad and sturdy shoulders of the scholastic gladiator had bent under the first pressure of his arm the weaker eck was the more noise he made as if his rhodomontades and accusations were to secure the victory which he had failed to obtain in debate the monks and all the partisans of rome re-echoing his clamour germany rang with invectives against luther who however remained passive the more i see my name covered with opprobrium said he in finishing the expositions which he published on the propositions of leipzig the prouder i feel the truth in other words christ must increase but i must decrease the voice of the bridegroom and the bride delights me more than all this clamour dismays me men are not the authors of my sufferings and i have no hatred against them it is satan the prince of evil who would terrify me but he who is in us is greater than he who is in the world the judgment of our contemporaries is bad that of posterity will be better if the leipzig discussion multiplied luther's enemies in germany it also increased the number of his friends abroad what huss was formerly in bohemia you o martin are now in saxony wrote the brothers of bohemia to him wherefore pray and be strong in the lord about this time war was declared between luther and emser now a professor of leipzig the latter addressed a letter to dr zach a zealous roman catholic of prague in which his professed object was to disabuse the hussites of the idea that luther was of their party luther could not doubt that under the semblance of defending him the learned leipziger's real purpose was to fasten on him a suspicion of adhering to the bohemian heresy and he resolved to tear aside the veil under which his old dresden host was endeavouring to shroud his enmity with this view he published a letter addressed to the goat emser emser's arms being a goat luther concludes with a sentiment which well delineates his own character to love all but fear none while new friends and new enemies thus appeared old friends seemed to draw off from luther Staupitz, who had been the means of bringing the reformer out of the obscurity of the cloister of erfurt began to show him some degree of coolness luther was rising too high for Staupitz to follow him you abandon me wrote luther to him the whole day i have been exceedingly grieved on your account like a child just weaned and weeping for its mother last night continues the reformer i dreamed of you you were keeping aloof from me and i was sobbing and shedding tears then you gave me your hand and told me to dry up my tears for you would return to me the pacificator miltitz wished to make a new attempt at conciliation but what hold can be had on men while still under the excitement of the contest his endeavours led to no result he brought the famous rose of gold but the elector did not even take the trouble to receive it in person frederick knew the artifices of rome and was not to be imposed upon end of book five chapter seven book five chapter eight of history of the reformation in the sixteenth century volume two by jean henri mel d'aubigne translated by henry beveridge this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter eight far from drawing back 
luther uniformly continued to advance and at this time struck one of his severest blows at error by publishing his first commentary on the epistle to the galatians on the third of september fifteen hundred and nineteen it is true the second commentary was superior to the first but still the first contained a forcible exposition of the doctrine of justification by faith every expression of the new apostle was full of life and god employed him to imbue the hearts of the people with divine knowledge christ gave himself for our sins said luther to his contemporaries it was not silver or gold that he gave for us nor was it a man or angels he gave himself himself out of whom there is no true greatness and this incomparable treasure he gave for our sins where now are those who proudly boast of the powers of our will where are the lessons of moral philosophy where the power and strength of the law our sins being so great that they cannot possibly be taken away without an immense ransom shall we pretend to acquire righteousness by the energy of our will by the power of the law and the doctrines of men what will all these cunning devices all these illusions avail us ah we will only cover our iniquities with a spurious righteousness and convert ourselves into hypocrites whom no worldly power can save but while luther thus proves that man's only salvation is in christ he also shows how this salvation changes his nature and enables him to abound in good works the man says he who has truly heard the word of christ and keeps it is immediately clothed with the spirit of charity if thou lovest him who has made thee a present of twenty florins or done thee some service or in some way given thee a proof of his affection how much more oughtest thou to love him who on thy account has given not silver or gold but himself received so many wounds endured a bloody sweat even died for thee in one word who in paying for all thy sins has annihilated death and secured for thee a father full of love in heaven if thou lovest him not thy heart has not listened to the things which he has done thou hast not believed them for faith works by love this epistle said luther in speaking of the epistle to the galatians is my epistle i am married to it his opponents caused him to proceed at a quicker pace than he would otherwise have done at this time eck instigated the franciscans of utterbock to make a new attack upon him and luther in his reply not satisfied with repeating what he had already taught attacked errors which he had recently discovered i would fain know says he in what part of scripture the power of canonizing saints has been given to the popes and also what the necessity or even the utility is of canonizing them however adds he ironically let them canonize as they will these new attacks of luther remained unanswered the blindness of his enemies was as favourable to him as his own courage they passionately defended secondary matters and said not a word when they saw the foundations of roman doctrines shaking under his hand while they were eagerly defending some outworks their intrepid adversary penetrated into the heart of the citadel and there boldly planted the standard of truth and hence their astonishment when they saw the fortress sapped blazing and falling to pieces amid the flames at the moment when they thought it impregnable and were hurling defiance at their assailants thus it is that great changes are accomplished the sacrament of the lord's supper began at this time to engage luther's attention he looked for it in the mass but in vain one day shortly after his return from leipzig he mounted the pulpit let us mark his words for they are the first which he pronounced on a subject which afterwards divided the church and the reformation into two parties in the holy sacrament of the altar says he there are three things which it is necessary to know the sign which must be external visible and under a corporal form 
the thing signified which is internal spiritual and within the mind and faith which avails itself of both had the definitions not been pushed farther unity would not have been destroyed luther continues it were good that the church should by a general council decree that both kinds shall be distributed to all the faithful not however on the ground that one kind is insufficient for faith by itself would be sufficient these bold words pleased his audience though some were astonished and offended and exclaimed this is false and scandalous the preacher continues there is no union closer deeper or more inseparable than that between food and the body which is nourished by it in the sacrament christ unites himself to us so closely that he acts in us as if he were identified with us our sins attack him his righteousness defends us but luther not deeming it enough to expound the truth attacks one of the most fundamental errors of rome the roman church pretends that the sacrament operates by itself independently of the disposition of him who receives it nothing can be more convenient than such an opinion since to it both the eagerness with which the sacrament is taught and the profits of the clergy are to be ascribed luther attacks this doctrine and maintains its opposite that is that faith and a right disposition of heart are indispensable this energetic protestation was destined to overthrow ancient superstitions but strange to say it attracted no attention rome overlooked what might have made her scream in agony and impetuously attacked the unimportant observation which luther threw out at the commencement of his discourse concerning communion in two kinds the discourse having been published in december a general cry of heresy was raised it is just the doctrine of prague unadulterated was the exclamation at the court of dresden where the sermon arrived during the christmas festivals it is written moreover in german in order to make it accessible to the common people the devotion of the prince was troubled and on the third day of the festival he wrote to his cousin frederick since the publication of this discourse the number of persons who receive the sacrament in two kinds has received an increase of six thousand your luther from being a professor of wittemberg is on the eve of becoming a bishop of prague and an arch heretic the cry was he was born in bohemia of bohemian parents he was brought up at prague and trained in the writings of wycliffe luther judged it right to contradict these rumours in a writing in which he gravely detailed his parentage i was born at eisleben said he and was baptized in st peter's church the nearest town to bohemia in which i have ever been is dresden the letter of duke george did not prejudice the elector against luther for a few days after he invited him to a splendid entertainment which he gave to the spanish ambassador and at which luther valiantly combated the minister of charles the elector's chaplain had by his master's order requested luther to use moderation in defending his cause excessive folly displeases man replied luther to spalatin but excessive wisdom displeases god the gospel cannot be defended without tumult and scandal the word of god is sword war ruin scandal destruction poison and hence as amos expresses it it presents itself like a bear in the path and a lioness in the forest i ask nothing i demand nothing there is one greater than i who asks and demands whether he stands or falls i am neither gainer nor loser it was obvious that faith and courage were about to become more necessary to luther than ever eck was forming projects of revenge instead of the laurels which he had counted on gaining he had become a laughing-stock to all men of intellect throughout the nation cutting satires were published against him eck was cut to the very heart by an epistle of ignorant canons written by echolampadius 
and a complaint against him probably by the excellent pirkheimer of nuremberg exhibiting a combination of sarcasm and dignity of which the provincial letters of pascal alone can give some idea luther expressed his dissatisfaction with some of these writings it is better said he to attack openly than to keep barking behind a hedge how greatly the chancellor of ingolstadt had miscalculated his countrymen abandoned him and he prepares for a journey beyond the alps to invoke the aid of strangers wherever he goes he vents his threatenings against luther melanchthon karlstadt and the elector himself from the haughtiness of his expressions says the doctor of wittemberg one would say he imagines himself to be god almighty inflamed with rage and thirsting for vengeance Eck, having in February 1520 published a work on the primacy of St. Peter, a work devoid of sound criticism, in which he maintained that this apostle, the first of the popes, resided for twenty-five years at Rome, set out for Italy in order to receive the reward of his pretended triumphs, and to forge at Rome, near the papal capital, thunders mightier than the frail scholastic arms which had given way in his hands luther was aware of all the dangers to which the journey of his antagonist would expose him but he feared not spalatin alarmed urged him to make proposals of peace no replied luther so long as he clamours i cannot decline the contest i commit the whole affair to god and leave my bark to the winds and waves it is the battle of the lord how can it be imagined that christ will advance his cause by peace did he not combat even unto death and have not all the martyrs since done the same such was the position of the two combatants of leipzig at the commencement of the year fifteen hundred and twenty the one was stirring up the whole papacy to strike a blow at his rival who on his part waited for war as calmly as if he had been waiting for peace the year on which we are entering will see the bursting of the storm end of book 5 chapter 8book 6 chapter 1 of history of the reformation in the 16th century volume 2 by jean henri mail d'aubigne translated by henry beveridge this recording is in the public domain Recording by Christopher Smith Chapter 1 A new character was going to appear upon the stage. God saw meet to place the monk of Wittenberg in the presence of the most powerful monarch who had appeared in Christendom since Charlemagne. He chose a prince, in the fervid vigour of youth, to whom everything presaged a reign of long duration a prince whose sceptre extended over a considerable portion both of the old and the new world so that according to a celebrated expression the sun never set on his vast dominions and opposed him to this humble reformation which began with the anguish and sighs of a poor monk in the obscure cell of a convent at erfurt the history of this monarch and his reign seems to have been destined to give a great lesson to the world it was to show the nothingness of all the power of man when it presumes to contend with the weakness of god had a prince friendly to luther been called to the empire the success of the reformation would have been attributed to his protection had even an emperor opposed to the new doctrine but feeble occupied the throne the triumphant success of the work would have been accounted for by the feebleness of the monarch but it was the proud conqueror of pavia who behoved to humble his pride before the power of the divine word that all the world might see how he who had found it easy to drag francis i a captive to madrid was compelled to lower his sword before the son of a poor miner the emperor maximilian was dead and the electors had met at frankfurt to give him a successor in the circumstances in which europe was placed this election was of vast importance and was regarded with deep interest by all christendom 
maximilian had not been a great prince but his memory was dear to the people who took a pleasure in remembering his presence of mind and good-humoured affability luther often talked of him to his friends and one day related the following anecdote a beggar had kept running after him asking charity and addressing him as his brother for said he we are both descended from the same father adam i am poor continued he but you are rich and it is your duty to assist me at these words the emperor turned round and said to him hold there's a penny go to your other brothers and if each gives you as much you will soon be richer than i am the person about to be called to the empire was not a good-natured maximilian times were to undergo a change ambitious potentates were competing for the imperial throne of the west the reins of the empire were to be seized by an energetic hand profound peace was to be succeeded by long and bloody wars at the assembly of frankfurt three kings aspired to the crown of the caesars a youthful prince grandson of the last emperor born at the opening of the century and consequently nineteen years of age first presented himself he was named charles and was born at ghent his paternal grandmother mary daughter of charles the bold had left him flanders and the rich states of burgundy his mother joan daughter of ferdinand of aragon and isabella of castile and wife of philip son of the emperor maximilian had transmitted to him the united kingdoms of spain naples and sicily to which christopher columbus had added a new world while the recent death of his grandfather put him in possession of the hereditary states of austria this young prince was endowed with great talents to a turn for military exercises in which the dukes of burgundy had long been distinguished to the finesse and penetration of the italians to the reverence for existing institutions which still characterizes the house of austria and promised the papacy a firm defender he joined a thorough knowledge of public affairs acquired under the direction of chievre having from fifteen years of age taken part in all the deliberations of his cabinet these diversified qualities were in a manner shrouded under spanish reserve and taciturnity in personal appearance he was tall in stature and had somewhat of a melancholy air he is pious and tranquil said luther and i believe he does not speak as much in a year as i do in a day had the character of charles been formed under the influence of freedom and christianity he would perhaps have been one of the most admirable princes on record but politics engrossed his life and stifled his great and good qualities not contented with all the sceptres which he grasped in his hand young charles aspired to the imperial dignity it is like a sunbeam which throws lustre on the house which it illumines said several but put forth the hand to lay hold of it and you will find nothing charles on the contrary saw in it the pinnacle of all earthly grandeur and a means of acquiring a magic influence over the spirit of the nations francis i was the second of the competitors the young paladins of the court of this chivalric king were incessantly representing to him that he was entitled like charlemagne to be the emperor of all the west and reviving the exploits of the ancient knights to attack the crescent which was menacing the empire discomfort the infidels and recover the holy sepulchre it is necessary said the ambassadors of francis to the electors it is necessary to prove to the dukes of austria that the imperial crown is not hereditary besides in existing circumstances germany has need not of a young man of nineteen but of a prince who to an experienced judgment joins talents which have already been recognized francis will unite the arms of franco and lombardy to those of germany and make war on the mussulmans sovereign of the duchy of milan he is already a member of the imperial body these arguments the french ambassadors supported by four hundred thousand crowns which they distributed in purchasing votes and in festivities by which they endeavoured to gain over their guests 
the third competitor was henry the eighth who jealous of the influence which the choice of the electors might give to francis or charles also entered the lists but soon left his powerful rivals sole disputants for the crown the electors were not disposed to favour either their subjects thought that they would have in francis a foreign master and a master who might deprive the electors themselves of their independence as he had lately deprived the nobles of his own dominions as to charles it was an ancient rule with the electors not to choose a prince who was already playing an important part in the empire the pope shared in these fears he wished neither the king of naples who was his neighbour nor the king of france whose enterprising spirit filled him with alarm choose rather some one from among yourselves was his message to the electors the elector of treves proposed frederick of saxony and the imperial crown was laid at the feet of luther's friend this choice would have obtained the approbation of all germany frederick's wisdom and affection for his people were well known during the revolt of erfurt he had been urged to take the town by assault and refused in order to spare blood but it will not cost five men a single man would be too many replied the prince the triumph of the reformation seemed on the eve of being secured by the election of its protector ought not frederick to have regarded the offer of the electors as a call from god himself who could have presided better over the destinies of the empire than a prince of so much wisdom who could have been stronger to oppose the turks than an emperor strong in faith the refusal of the elector of saxony so much lauded by historians was perhaps a fault for the contests which afterwards tore germany to pieces he is perhaps partly to blame but it is difficult to say whether frederick deserves censure for his want of faith or honour for his humility he thought that even the safety of the empire made it his duty to refuse the crown to save germany said this modest and disinterested prince an emperor more powerful than i is requisite the legate of rome seeing that the choice would fall upon charles intimated that the pope withdrew his objections and on the twenty eighth of june the grandson of maximilian was elected god said frederick afterwards gave him to us in mercy and in anger the spanish envoys sent a present of thirty thousand gold florins to the elector of saxony as a mark of their master's gratitude but the prince refused it and charged his ministers not to accept of any present at the same time he secured the german liberties by an engagement to which the envoys of charles took an oath in his name the circumstances in which the latter prince encircled his head with the imperial crown seemed still better fitted than the oath to secure the germanic liberties and the success of the reformation the young prince was jealous of the laurels which his rival francis i had gained at marignan the struggle was to be continued in italy and in the meantime the reformation would doubtless be made secure charles left spain in may fifteen hundred and twenty and was crowned on the twenty second of october at aix la chapelle end of book six chapter one book six chapter two of history of the reformation in the sixteenth century volume two by jean henri mail d'aubigne translated by henry beveridge this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter two luther had foreseen that the cause of the reformation would soon be brought before the new emperor and when charles was still at madrid addressed a letter to him in which he said if the cause which i defend is worthy of being presented before the heavenly majesty it cannot be unworthy of engaging the attention of a prince of this world o oh, charles prince of the kings of the earth i cast myself as a suppliant at the feet of your most serene majesty and beseech you to deign to take under the shadow of your wings not me but the very cause of eternal truth for the defence of which god has entrusted you with the sword 
the young king of spain threw aside this odd letter from a german monk and returned no answer while luther was turning in vain toward madrid the storm seemed gathering around him fanaticism was rekindled in germany hochstraten indefatigable in his efforts at persecution had extracted certain theses from luther's writings and obtained their condemnation by the universities of cologne and louvain that of erfurt which had always had a grudge against luther for having given wittemberg the preference was on the eve of following their example but the doctor having been informed of it wrote langer in terms so energetic that the theologians of erfurt took fright and said nothing still however there was enough to inflame the minds of men in the condemnation pronounced by cologne and louvain more than this the priests of misnia who had espoused emser's quarrel said openly such is melancthon's statement that there would be no sin in killing luther the time is come said luther when men think that they will do jesus christ's service by putting us to death the murderous language of the priests did not fail of its effect one day says a biographer when luther was in front of the augustine convent a stranger with a pistol hid under his arm accosted him and said why do you walk about thus quite alone i am in the hands of god replied luther he is my strength and my shield thereupon adds the biographer the stranger grew pale and fled trembling about the same time serra longa the orator of the conference of augsburg wrote to the elector let not luther find any asylum in the states of your highness but repulsed by all let him be stoned to death in the face of heaven this would please me more than a gift of ten thousand crowns but the sound of the gathering storm was heard especially in the direction of rome valentine teutelben a noble of thuringia vicar of the archbishop of mentz and a zealous partisan of the papacy was the representative of the elector of saxony at rome teutelben ashamed of the protection which his master gave to the heretical monk could not bear to see his mission paralyzed by this imprudent conduct and imagined that by alarming the elector he would induce him to abandon the rebel theologian writing to his master he said i am not listened to because of the protection which you give to luther but the romans were mistaken if they thought they could frighten sage frederick he knew that the will of god and the movements of the people were more irresistible than the decrees of the papal chancery he ordered his envoy to hint to the pope that far from defending luther he had always left him to defend himself that he had moreover told him to quit saxony and the university that the doctor had declared his readiness to obey and would not now be in the electoral states had not the legate charles de miltitz begged the prince to keep him near himself from a fear that in other countries he would act with still less restraint than in saxony frederick did still more he tried to enlighten rome germany continues he in his letter now possesses a great number of learned men distinguished for scholarship and science the laity themselves begin to cultivate their understanding and to love the holy scriptures hence there is great reason to fear that if the equitable proposals of dr luther are not accepted peace will never be re-established the doctrine of luther has struck its roots deep in many hearts if instead of refuting it by passages from the bible an attempt is made to crush him by the thunders of ecclesiastical power great scandal will be given and pernicious and dreadful outbreaks will ensue the elector having full confidence in luther caused teutelben's letter to be communicated to him and also another letter from cardinal st george the reformer was moved on reading them he at once saw all the dangers by which he was surrounded and for an instant his heart sank but it was in such moments as these that his faith displayed its full power often when feeble and ready to fall into despondency he rallied again and seemed greater amid the raging of the storm he would fain have been delivered from all these trials 
but aware of the price that must have been paid for repose he spurned it with indignation be silent said he i am disposed to be so if i am allowed that is to say if others are silent if any one envies my situation he is welcome to it if any one is desirous to destroy my writings let him burn them i am ready to remain quiet provided gospel truth is not compelled to be quiet also i ask not a cardinal's hat i ask neither gold nor aught that rome esteems there is nothing which i will not concede provided christians are not excluded from the way of salvation all their threatenings do not terrify all their promises cannot seduce me animated by these sentiments luther soon resumed his warlike temperament preferring the christian combat to the calmness of solitude one night was sufficient to revive his desire of overthrowing rome my part is taken wrote he next day i despise the fury of rome and i despise her favour no more reconciliation no more communication with her for ever let her condemn and burn my writings i in my turn will condemn and publicly burn the pontifical law that nest of all heresies the moderation which i have shown up to this hour has been useless and i have done with it his friends were far from feeling equally tranquil great alarm prevailed at wittemberg we are waiting in extreme anxiety said melancthon i would sooner die than be separated from luther unless god come to our assistance we perish writing a month later in his anxiety he says our luther still lives and god grant he long may for the roman sycophants are using every mean to destroy him pray for the life of him who is sole vindicator of sound theology these prayers were not in vain the warnings which the elector had given rome through his envoy were not without foundation the word of luther had been everywhere heard in cottages and convents at the firesides of the citizens in the castles of nobles in academies in the palaces of kings he had said to duke john of saxony let my life only have contributed to the salvation of a single individual and i will willingly consent that all my books perish not a single individual but a great multitude had found light in the writings of the humble doctor and hence in all quarters there were men ready to protect him the sword which was to attack him was on the anvil of the vatican but there were heroes in germany who would interpose their bodies as his buckler at the moment when the bishops were waxing wrath when princes were silent when the people were awaiting the result and when the thunder was already grumbling on the seven hills god raised up the german nobility and placed them as a rampart around his servant at this time sylvester of schaumburg one of the most powerful nobles of franconia sent his son to wittemberg with a letter for the reformer in which he said your life is exposed to danger if the support of electors princes or magistrates fails you i beg you to beware of going into bohemia where of old very learned men had much to suffer come rather to me god willing i shall soon have collected more than a hundred gentlemen and with their help will be able to keep you free from harm francis of seckingen the hero of his age whose intrepid courage we have already seen loved the reformer because he found that he was worthy of love and also because he was hated by the monks my person my property and services all that i possess wrote he to him is at your disposal your wish is to maintain christian truth and in that i am ready to assist you harmut of kronberg spoke in similar terms ulrich von hutten the poet and valiant knight of the sixteenth century ceased not to speak in commendation of luther but how great the contrast between these two men hutten wrote to the reformer we must have swords bows javelins and bullets to destroy the fury of the devil luther on receiving these letters exclaimed 
i have no wish that men should have recourse to arms and carnage in order to defend the gospel it was by the word the world was overcome by the word the church has been saved and by the word will she be re-established i despise not his offers said he on receiving the above letter from schaumburg but still i wish to lean on none but christ so spake not the pontiffs of rome when they waded in the blood of the vaudois and albigenses hutton was sensible of the difference between his cause and luther's and accordingly wrote with noble frankness i am occupied with the things of man but you rising to a far greater height give yourself wholly to those of god after thus writing he set out to try if possible to gain over ferdinand and charles v to the truth thus on the one hand luther's enemies assail him and on the other his friends rise up to defend him my bark says he floats here and there at the pleasure of the winds hope and fear reign by turns but what matters it still his mind was not uninfluenced by the marks of sympathy which he received the lord reigns said he and so visibly as to be almost palpable luther saw that he was no longer alone his words had proved faithful and the thought inspired him with new courage now that he has other defenders prepared to brave the fury of rome he will no longer be kept back by the fear of compromising the elector he becomes more free and if possible more decided this is an important period in the development of luther's mind writing at this time to the elector's chaplain he says rome must be made aware that though she should succeed by her menaces in exiling me from wittemberg she will only damage her cause those who are ready to defend me against the thunders of the papacy are to be found not in bohemia but in the heart of germany if i have not yet done to my enemies all that i am preparing for them they must ascribe it neither to my moderation nor to their tyranny but to my fear of compromising the name of the elector and the prosperity of the university of wittemberg now that i have no longer any such fears i will rush with new impetuosity on rome and her courtiers still luther's hope was not placed on the great he had often been urged to dedicate a book to duke john the elector's brother but had never done it i fear he had said that the suggestion comes from himself the holy scriptures must be subservient only to the glory of god's name luther afterwards laid aside his suspicions and dedicated his discourse on good works to duke john a discourse in which he gives a forcible exposition of the doctrine of justification by faith a mighty doctrine whose power he rates far higher than the sword of hutton the army of sickingen or the protection of dukes and electors the first the noblest the sublimest of all works says he is faith in jesus christ from this work all other works should proceed they are all the vassals of faith and from it alone derive their efficacy if a man's own heart assures him that what he is doing is agreeable to god the work is good should it be merely the lifting up of a straw but in the absence of this assurance the work is not good though it should be the raising of the dead a pagan a jew a turk a sinner can all do other works but to trust firmly in the lord and feel assured of pleasing him are works of which none are capable but the christian strengthened by grace a christian who has faith in god acts at all times with freedom and gladness whereas the man who is not at one with god is full of cares and is detained in thraldom he anxiously asks how many works he ought to do he runs up and down interrogating this man and that man and nowhere finding any peace does everything with dissatisfaction and fear hence i have always extolled faith but it is otherwise in the world there the essential point is to have many works works great and high and of all dimensions 
while it is a matter of indifference whether or not faith animates them thus men build their peace not on the good pleasure of god but on their own merits that is to say on the sand matthew chapter 7 verse 27 to preach faith is it is said to prevent good works but though a single man should have in himself the powers of all men or even of all creatures the mere obligation of living by faith would be a task too great for him ever to accomplish if i say to a sick person be in health and you will have the use of your members will it be said that i forbid him to use his members must not health precede labor the same holds true in the preaching of faith it must be before works in order that works themselves may exist where then you will ask is this faith found and how is it received this indeed is the most important of all questions faith comes solely from jesus christ who is promised and given gratuitously o man represent christ to thyself and consider how in him god manifests his mercy to thee without being anticipated by any merit on thy part in this image of his grace receive the faith and assurance that all thy sins are forgiven thee works cannot produce it it flows from the blood the wounds and the death of christ whence it wells up in the heart christ is the rock out of which come milk and honey deuteronomy chapter 32 not being able to give an account of all luther's works we have quoted some short fragments of this discourse on good works on account of the opinion which the reformer himself had of it it is in my judgment said he the best work that i have published he immediately subjoins this profound observation but i know that when anything i write pleases myself the infection of this bad leaven prevents it from pleasing others melancthon in sending a copy of this discourse to a friend thus expressed himself of all greek and latin authors none has come nearer the spirit of st paul than luther end of book six chapter two book six chapter three of history of the reformation in the sixteenth century volume two by jean henri mel d'aubigne translated by henry beveridge this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter three but the substitution of a system of meritorious works for the idea of grace and amnesty was not the only evil existing in the church a domineering power had risen up among the humble pastors of christ's flock luther must attack this usurped authority a vague and distant rumour of ex intrigues and success at rome awakened a warlike spirit in the reformer who amid all his turmoil had calmly studied the origin progress and usurpations of the papacy his discoveries having filled him with surprise he no longer hesitated to communicate them and strike the blow which was destined like the rod of moses of old to awaken a whole nation out of a lethargy the result of long bondage even before rome had time to publish her formidable bull he published his declaration of war the time of silence exclaims he is past the time for speaking has arrived the mysteries of antichrist must at length be unveiled on the twenty fourth of june fifteen hundred and two he published his famous appeal to his imperial majesty and the christian nobility of germany on the reformation of christianity this work was the signal of the attack which was at once to complete the rupture and decide the victory it is not from presumption says he at the outset of this treatise that i who am only one of the people undertake to address your lordships the misery and oppression endured at this moment by all the states of christendom and more especially by germany wring from me a cry of distress i must call for aid 
i must see whether god will not give his spirit to some one of our countrymen and stretch out a hand to our unhappy nation god has given us a young and generous prince the emperor charles v and thus filled our hearts with high hopes but we too must on our own part do all we can now the first thing necessary is not to confide in our own great strength or our own high wisdom when any work otherwise good is begun in self-confidence god casts it down and destroys it frederick the first frederick the second and many other emperors besides before whom the world trembled have been trampled upon by the popes because they trusted more to their own strength than to god they could not but fall in this war we have to combat the powers of hell and our mode of conducting it must be to expect nothing from the strength of human weapons to trust humbly in the lord and look still more to the distress of christendom than to the crimes of the wicked it may be that by a different procedure the work would begin under more favourable appearances but suddenly in the heat of the contest confusion would arise bad men would cause fearful disaster and the world would be deluged with blood the greater the power the greater the danger when things are not done in the fear of the lord after this exordium luther continues the romans to guard against every species of reformation have surrounded themselves with three walls when attacked by the temporal power they denied its jurisdiction over them and maintained the superiority of the spiritual power when tested by scripture they replied that none could interpret it but the pope when threatened with a council they again replied that none but the pope could convene it they have thus carried off from us the three rods destined to chastise them and abandoned themselves to all sorts of wickedness but now may god be our help and give us one of the trumpets which threw down the walls of jericho let us blow down the walls of paper and straw which the romans have built around them and lift up the rods which punish the wicked by bringing the wiles of the devil to the light of day luther next commences the attack and shakes to the foundation of that papal monarchy which had for ages united the nations of the west into one body under the sceptre of the roman bishop there is no sacerdotal caste in christianity this truth of which the church was so early robbed he vigorously expounds in the following terms it has been said that the pope the bishops the priests and all those who people convents form the spiritual or ecclesiastical estate and that princes nobles citizens and peasants form the secular or lay estate this is a specious tale but let no man be alarmed all christians belong to the spiritual estate and the only difference between them is in the functions which they fulfil we have all but one baptism but one faith and these constitute the spiritual man unction tonsure ordination consecration given by the pope or by a bishop may make a hypocrite but can never make a spiritual man we are all consecrated priests by baptism as st peter says you are a royal priesthood although all do not actually perform the offices of kings and priests because no one can assume what is common to all without the common consent but if this consecration of god did not belong to us the unction of the pope could not make a single priest if ten brothers the sons of one king and possessing equal claims to his inheritance should choose one of their number to administer for them they would all be kings and yet only one of them would be the administrator of their common power so it is in the church were several pious laymen banished to a desert and were they from not having among them a priest consecrated by a bishop to agree in selecting one of their number whether married or not he would be as truly a priest as if all the bishops of the world had consecrated him in this way were augustine ambrose and cyprian elected 
hence it follows that laymen and priests princes and bishops or as we have said ecclesiastics and laics have nothing to distinguish them but their functions they have all the same condition but they have not all the same work to perform this being so why should not the magistrate correct the clergy the secular power was appointed by god for the punishment of the wicked and the protection of the good and must be left free to act through christendom without respect of persons be they pope bishops priests monks or nuns st paul says to all christians let every soul and consequently the pope also be subject to the higher powers for they bear not the sword in vain luther after throwing down the other two walls in the same way takes a review of all the abuses of rome with an eloquence of a truly popular description he exposes evils which had for ages been notorious never had a nobler remonstrance been heard the assembly which luther addresses is the church the power whose abuses he attacks is that papacy which had for ages been the oppressor of all nations and the reformation for which he calls aloud is destined to exercise its powerful influence on christendom all over the world and so long as man shall exist upon it he begins with the pope it is monstrous says he to see him who calls himself the vicar of jesus christ displaying a magnificence unequalled by that of any emperor is this the way in which he proves his resemblance to lowly jesus or humble peter he is it is said the lord of the world but christ whose vicar he boasts to be has said my kingdom is not of this world can the power of a vicegerent exceed that of his prince luther proceeds to depict the consequences of the papal domination do you know of what use the cardinals are i will tell you italy and germany have many convents foundations and benefices richly endowed how could their revenues be brought to rome cardinals were created then on them cloisters and prelacies were bestowed and at this hour italy is almost a desert the convents are destroyed the bishoprics devoured the towns in decay the inhabitants corrupted worship dying out and preaching abolished why because all the revenues of the churches go to rome never would the turk himself have so ruined italy luther next turns to his countrymen and now they that have thus sucked the blood of their own country they come into germany they begin gently but let us be on our guard germany will soon become like italy we have already some cardinals their thought is before the rustic germans comprehend our design they will have neither bishopric nor convent nor benefice nor penny nor farthing antichrist must possess the treasures of the earth thirty or forty cardinals will be elected in a single day to one will be given bamberg to another the duchy of Würzburg, and rich benefices will be annexed until the churches and cities are laid desolate and then the pope will say i am the vicar of christ and the pastor of his flocks let the germans be resigned luther's indignation rises how do we germans submit to such robbery and concussion on the part of the pope if france has successfully resisted why do we allow ourselves to be thus sported with and insulted ah if they deprived us of nothing but our goods but they ravage churches plunder the sheep of christ abolish the worship and suppress the word of god luther then exposes the devices of rome to obtain money and secure the revenues of germany anats palliums commendams administrations expected favours incorporations reservations etc all pass in review then he says let us endeavour to put a stop to this desolation and misery if we would march against the turks let us begin with the worst species of them 
if we hang pickpockets and behead robbers let us not allow roman avarice to escape avarice which is the greatest of all thieves and robbers and that too in the name of st peter and jesus christ who can endure it who can be silent is not all that the pope possesses stolen he neither purchased it nor inherited it from st peter nor acquired it by the sweat of his own brow where then did he get it luther proposes remedies for all these evils and energetically arouses the german nobility to put an end to roman depredation he next comes to the reform of the pope himself is it not ridiculous says he that the pope should pretend to be the lawful heir of the empire who gave it to him was it jesus christ when he said the kings of the earth exercise lordship over them but it shall not be so with you luke chapter twenty two verses twenty five and twenty six how can he govern an empire and at the same time preach pray study and take care of the poor jesus christ forbade his disciples to carry with them gold or clothes because the office of the ministry cannot be performed without freedom from every other care yet the pope would govern the empire and at the same time remain pope luther continues to strip the sovereign pontiff of his spoils let the pope renounce every species of title to the kingdom of naples and sicily he has no more right to it than i have his possession of bologna imola ravenna romagna marsh d'ancona etc is unjust and contrary to the commands of jesus christ no man says paul who goeth a warfare entangleth himself with the affairs of this life second timothy chapter two verse two and the pope who pretends to take the lead in the war of the gospel entangles himself more with the affairs of this life than any emperor or king he must be disencumbered of all this toil the emperor should put a bible and a prayer book into the hands of the pope that the pope may leave kings to govern and devote himself to preaching and prayer luther is as averse to the pope's ecclesiastical power in germany as to his temporal power in italy the first thing necessary is to banish from all the countries of germany the legates of the pope and the pretended blessings which they sell us at the weight of gold and which are sheer imposture they take our money and why for legalizing ill-gotten gain for loosing oaths and teaching us to break faith to sin and go direct to hell hearest thou o pope not pope most holy but pope most sinful may god from his place in heaven cast down thy throne into the infernal abyss the christian tribune pursues his course after citing the pope to his bar he cites all the abuses in the train of the papacy and endeavours to sweep away from the church all the rubbish by which it is encumbered he begins with the monks and now i come to a lazy band which promises much but performs little be not angry dear sirs my intention is good what i have to say is a truth at once sweet and bitter that is that it is no longer necessary to build cloisters for mendicant monks good god we have only too many of them and would they were all suppressed to wander vagabond over the country never has done and never will do good the marriage of ecclesiastics comes next in course it is the first occasion on which luther speaks of it into what a state have the clergy fallen and how many priests are burdened with women and children and remorse while no one comes to their assistance let the pope and the bishops run their course and let those who will go to perdition all very well but i am resolved to unburden my conscience and open my mouth freely however pope bishops and others may be offended i say then that according to the institution of jesus christ and the apostles every town ought to have a pastor or bishop and that this pastor may have a wife as st paul writes to timothy let the bishop be the husband of one wife first timothy chapter three verse two 
and as is still practised in the greek church but the devil has persuaded the pope as st paul tells timothy first timothy chapter four verses one to three to forbid the clergy to marry and hence evils so numerous that it is impossible to give them in detail how are we to save the many pastors who are blameworthy only in this that they live with a female to whom they wish with all their heart to be lawfully united ah let them save their conscience let them take this woman in lawful wedlock and live decently with her not troubling themselves whether it pleases or displeases the pope the salvation of your soul is of greater moment than arbitrary and tyrannical laws laws not imposed by the lord in this way the reformation sought to restore purity of morals within the church the reformer continues let feast days be abolished and let sunday only be kept or if it is deemed proper to keep the great christian festivals let them be celebrated in the morning and let the remainder of the day be a working day as usual for by the ordinary mode of spending them in drinking and gaming and committing all sorts of sins or in mere idleness god is offended on festivals much more than on other days he afterwards attacks the dedications of churches which he describes as mere taverns and after them fasts and fraternities he desires not only to suppress abuses but also to put an end to schisms it is time says he to take the case of the bohemians into serious consideration that hatred and envy may cease and union be again established he proposes excellent methods of conciliation and adds in this way must heretics be refuted by scripture as the ancient fathers did and not subdued by fire on a contrary system executioners would be the most learned of all doctors oh would to god that each party among us would shake hands with each other in fraternal humility rather than harden ourselves in the idea of our power and right charity is more necessary than the roman papacy i have now done what was in my power if the pope or his people oppose it they will have to give an account the pope should be ready to renounce the popedom and all his wealth and all his honours if he could thereby save a single soul but he would see the universe go to destruction sooner than yield a hairbreadth of his usurped power i am clear of these things luther next comes to universities and schools i much fear the universities will become wide gates to hell if due care is not taken to explain the holy scriptures and engrave it on the hearts of the students my advice to every person is not to place his child where the scripture does not reign paramount every institution in which the studies carried on lead to a relaxed consideration of the word of god must prove corrupting a weighty sentiment which governments literary men and parents in all ages would do well to ponder towards the end of his address he returns to the empire and the emperor the popes says he unable to lead the ancient masters of the roman empire at will resolved on wresting their title and their empire from them and giving it to us germans this they accomplished and we have become the bondmen to the pope for the pope has possessed himself of rome and bound the emperor by oath never to reside in it and the consequence is that the emperor is the emperor of rome without having rome we have the name the pope has the country and its cities we have the title and the insignia of empire the pope its treasury power privileges and freedom the pope eats the fruit and we amuse ourselves with the husk in this way our simplicity has always been abused by the pride and tyranny of the romans but now may god who has given us such an empire be our aid let us act conformably to our name our title our insignia let us save our freedom and give the romans to know that through their hands it was committed to us by god they boast of having given us an empire 
very well let us take what belongs to us let the pope surrender rome and every part of the empire that he possesses let him put an end to his taxes and extortions let him restore our liberty our power our wealth our honour our soul and our body let the empire be all that an empire ought to be and let the sword of princes no longer be compelled to lower itself before the hypocritical pretensions of a pope in these words there is not only energy and eloquence but also sound argument never did orator so speak to the nobility of the empire and to the emperor himself far from being surprised that so many german states revolted from rome we should wonder that all germany did not proceed to the banks of the tiber and there resume that imperial power the insignia of which the popes had imprudently placed on the head of their chief luther thus concludes his intrepid address i presume however that i have struck too high a note proposed many things that will appear impossible and been somewhat too severe on the many errors which i have attacked but what can i do better that the world be offended with me than god the utmost which it can take from me is life i have often offered to make peace with my opponents but through their instrumentality god has always obliged me to speak out against them i have still a chant upon rome in reserve and if they have an itching ear i will sing it to them at full pitch rome do ye understand me it is probable that luther here refers to a treatise on the papacy which he was preparing for publication but which never was published rector burckhardt writing at this time to spengler says there is moreover a short tract de execranda venere romanorum but it is kept in reserve the title of the work seems to intimate something which would have given great offence and it is pleasing to think that luther had moderation not to publish it if my cause is just continues he it must be condemned on the earth and justified only by christ in heaven therefore let pope bishops priests monks doctors come forward display all their zeal and give full vent to their fury assuredly they are just the people who ought to persecute the truth as in all ages they have persecuted it where did this monk obtain this clear knowledge of public affairs which even the states of the empire often find it so difficult to unravel whence did this german derive this courage which enables him to hold up his head among his countrymen who had been enslaved for so many ages and deal such severe blows to the papacy by what mysterious energy is he animated does it not seem that he must have heard the words which god addressed to one of ancient times lo i have strengthened thy face against their faces i have made thy forehead like a diamond and harder than flint be not then afraid because of them this exhortation being addressed to the german nobility was soon in the hands of all for whom it was intended it spread over germany with inconceivable rapidity luther's friends trembled while staupitz and those who wished to follow gentle methods thought the blow too severe in our days replied luther whatever is treated calmly falls into oblivion and nobody cares for it at the same time he displayed extraordinary simplicity and humility he was unconscious of his own powers i know not writes he what to say of myself perhaps i am the precursor of philip melanchthon like elias i am preparing the way for him in spirit and in power that he may one day trouble israel and the house of ahab but there was no occasion to wait for any other than he who had appeared the house of ahab was already shaken the address to the german nobility was published on the twenty sixth of june fifteen hundred and twenty and in a short time four thousand copies were sold a number at that period unprecedented the astonishment was universal and the whole people were in commotion 
the vigour spirit perspicuity and noble boldness by which it was pervaded made it truly a work for the people who felt that one who spoke in such terms truly loved them the confused views which many wise men entertained were enlightened all became aware of the usurpations of rome at wittemberg no man had any doubt whatever that the pope was antichrist even the elector's court with all its timidity and circumspection did not disapprove of the reformer but only awaited the issue the nobility and the people did not even wait the nation was awakened and had the voice of luther adopted his cause and rallied around his standard nothing could have been more advantageous to the reformer than this publication in palaces in castles in the dwellings of the citizens and even in cottages all are now prepared and made proof as it were against the sentence of condemnation which is about to fall upon the profit of the people all germany is on fire and the bull come when it may will never extinguish the conflagration End of Book 6, Chapter 3 Book 6, Chapter 4 of History of the Reformation in the Sixteenth Century, Volume 2, by Jean-Henri Mel d'Aubigné, translated by Henry Beveridge. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 4 at rome everything necessary for the condemnation of the defender of the liberty of the church was prepared men had long lived there in arrogant security the monks of rome had long accused leo x of devoting himself to luxury and pleasure and of spending his whole time in hunting theatricals and music while the church was crumbling to pieces at last through the clamour of dr eck who had come from leipzig to invoke the power of the vatican the pope the cardinals the monks all rome awoke and bestirred themselves to save the papacy rome in fact was obliged to adopt the severest measures the gauntlet had been thrown down and the combat was destined to be mortal luther attacked not the abuses of the roman pontificate but the pontificate itself at his bidding the pope was humbly to descend from his throne and again become a simple pastor or bishop on the banks of the tiber all the dignitaries of the roman hierarchy were required to renounce their riches and worldly glory and again become elders or deacons of the churches of italy all the splendour and power which had for ages dazzled the west behoved to vanish away and give place to the humble and simple worship of the primitive christians these things god could have done and will one day do but they were not to be expected from men even should a pope have been disinterested enough and bold enough to attempt the overthrow of the ancient and sumptuous edifice of the romish church thousands of priests and bishops would have rushed forward to its support the pope had received power under the express condition of maintaining whatever was entrusted to him rome deemed herself appointed of god to govern the church and no wonder therefore that she was prepared with this view to adopt the most decisive measures and yet at the outset she did show hesitation several cardinals and the pope himself were averse to severe proceedings leo had too much sagacity not to be aware that a decision the enforcement of which depended on the very dubious inclinations of the civil power might seriously compromise the authority of the church he saw moreover that the violent methods already resorted to had only increased the evil is it impossible to gain this saxon monk asked the politicians of rome would all the power of the church and all the wiles of italy be ineffectual for this purpose negotiation must still be attempted eck accordingly encountered formidable obstacles he neglected nothing to prevent what he termed impious concessions going up and down rome he gave vent to his rage and cried for vengeance 
the fanatical faction of the monks having immediately leagued with him he felt strong in this alliance and proceeded with new courage to importune the pope and the cardinals according to him all attempts at conciliation were useless the idea of it said he is only the vain dream of those who slumber at a distance from the sea but he knew the danger for he had wrestled with the audacious monk the thing necessary was to amputate the gangrened limb and so prevent the disease from attacking the whole body the blundering disputant of leipzig solves objections one after another and endeavours but finds it difficult to persuade the pope he wishes to save rome in spite of herself sparing no exertion he spent whole hours in deliberation in the cabinet of the pontiff and made application both to the court and the cloisters to the people and the church eck is calling to the depth of depths against me said luther and setting on fire the forests of lebanon at length he succeeded the fanatics in the councils of the papacy vanquished the politicians leo gave way and luther's condemnation was resolved eck began again to breathe and his pride felt gratified by the thought that his own efforts had procured the ruin of his heretical rival and thereby saved the church it was well said he that i came to rome at this time for little was known of luther's errors it will one day be seen how much i have done in this cause no one exerted himself so much in seconding dr eck as the master of the sacred palace sylvester masolini de prierio who had just published a work in which he maintained that not only to the pope alone appertained the infallible decision of all debatable points but also that papal ascendancy was the fifth monarchy of daniel and the only true monarchy that the pope was the prince of all ecclesiastical and the father of all secular princes the chief of the world and even in substance the world itself in another writing he affirmed that the pope is as much superior to the emperor as gold is to lead that the pope can appoint and depose emperors and electors establish and annul positive rights and that the emperor with all the laws and all the nations of christendom cannot decide the smallest matter contrary to the pope's will such was the voice which came forth from the palace of the sovereign pontiff such the monstrous fiction which in union with scholastic dogmas aimed at suppressing reviving truth had this fiction not been unmasked as it has been and that even by learned members of the catholic church there would have been neither true history nor true religion the papacy is not merely a lie in regard to the bible it is also a lie in regard to the annals of nations and hence the reformation by destroying its fascinating power has emancipated not only the church but also kings and nations the reformation has been described as a political work and in this secondary sense it truly was so thus god sent a spirit of delusion on the doctors of rome the separation between truth and error must now be accomplished and it is to error that the task is assigned had a compromise been entered into it must have been at the expense of truth for to mutilate truth in the slightest degree is to pave the way for her complete annihilation like the insect which is said to die on the loss of one of its antennae she must be complete in all her parts in order to display the energy which enables her to gain great and advantageous victories and propagate herself through coming ages to mingle any portion of error with truth is to throw a grain of poison into a large dish of food the grain suffices to change its whole nature and death ensues slowly it may be but yet surely those who defend the doctrine of christ against the attacks of its adversaries keep as jealous an eye on its farthest outposts as on the citadel itself for the moment the enemy gains any footing at all he is on the highway to conquest the roman pontiff determined at the period of which we now treat to rend the church 
and the fragment which remained in his hand however splendid soever it may be in vain endeavours under pompous ornaments to hide the deleterious principle by which it is attacked it is only where the word of god is that there is life luther however great his courage was would probably have been silent had rome been so and made some faint show of concession but god did not leave the reformation to depend on a weak human heart luther was under the guidance of a clearer intellect than his own the pope was the instrument in the hand of providence to sever every tie between the past and the future and launch the reformer on a new unknown and to him uncertain career and the difficult avenues to which he would if left to himself have been unable to find the papal bull was a writing of divorce sent from rome to the pure church of jesus christ as personified in him who was then her humble but faithful representative and the church accepted the writing on the understanding that she was thenceforth to depend on none but her heavenly head while at rome luther's condemnation was urged forward with so much violence a humble priest dwelling in one of the humble towns of helvetia and who had never had any correspondence with the reformer was deeply moved when he thought of the blow which was aimed at him while even the friends of the wittemberg doctor trembled in silence this mountaineer of switzerland was resolved to employ every means to stay the formidable bull his name was ulrich zwingli William de Fausson, who was secretary to the papal legate in Switzerland, and managed the affairs of Rome during the legate's absence, was his friend, and a few days before had said to him, "'While I live, you may calculate on obtaining from me everything that a true friend can be expected to give.' The Helvetian priest, trusting to this declaration, repaired to the Roman embassy. This, at least, may be inferred from one of his letters— for himself he had no fear of the dangers to which evangelical faith exposed him knowing that a disciple of jesus christ must always be ready to sacrifice his life all i ask of christ for myself said he to a friend to whom he was unbosoming his solicitude on luther's account all i ask is to be able to bear like a man whatever evils await me i am a vessel of clay in his hands let him break or let him strengthen me as seemeth to him good but the swiss evangelist had fears for the christian church should this formidable blow reach the reformer and he endeavoured to persuade the representative of rome to enlighten the pope and employ all the means in his power to prevent him from launching an excommunication at luther the dignity of the holy see itself said he to him is here at stake for if matters are brought to such a point germany in the height of her enthusiasm for the gospel and for its preacher will despise the pope and his anathemas the efforts of zwingli were in vain it appears indeed that when he was making them the blow had already been struck such was the first occasion on which the paths of the saxon doctor and the swiss priest met the latter we will again meet with in the course of this history and will see him gradually expanding and growing until he obtain a high standing in the church of the lord after luther's condemnation was at last resolved upon new difficulties arose in the consistory the theologians wished to proceed at once to fulmination whereas the lawyers were for beginning with a citation asking their theological colleagues was not adam first cited adam where art thou said the lord it was the same with cain the question asked him was where is thy brother abel these strange arguments drawn from scripture the canonists strengthened by appealing to the principles of the law of nature the certainty of a crime said they cannot deprive the criminal of his right of defence it is pleasing to find a sense of justice still existing in a roman consistory but these scruples did not suit the theologians who hurried on by passion thought only of proceeding to business with dispatch 
it was at length agreed that the doctrine of luther should be immediately condemned and that a period of sixty days should be granted to him and his adherents after which provided they did not retract they should all be ipso facto excommunicated de vio who had returned from germany in ill health was carried to the meeting that he might not lose this little triumph which carried with it some degree of consolation having been defeated at augsburg he longed to be able at rome to condemn the invincible monk before whom his knowledge finesse and authority had proved unavailing luther not being there to reply de vio felt himself strong a last conference which eck attended was held in presence of the pope himself in his villa at maliano on the fifteenth of june the sacred college resolved on condemnation and approved of the famous bull arise o lord said the roman pontiff speaking at this solemn moment as vicar of god and head of the church arise and be judge in thine own cause remember the insults daily offered to thee by infatuated men arise o peter remember thy holy roman church the mother of all churches and mistress of the faith arise o paul for here is a new porphyry who is attacking thy doctrines and the holy popes our predecessors arise in fine assembly of all the saints holy church of god and intercede with the almighty the pope afterwards quotes as pernicious scandalous and poisonous forty-one propositions in which luther had expounded the holy doctrine of the gospel among these propositions we find the following to deny that sin remains in an infant after baptism is to trample st paul and our lord jesus christ under foot a new life is the best and noblest penance to burn heretics is contrary to the will of the holy spirit etc the moment this bull is published continued the pope it will be the duty of the bishops to make careful search for the writings of martin luther which contain these errors and to burn them publicly and solemnly in the presence of the clergy and laity in regard to martin himself good god what have we not done imitating the goodness of the almighty we are ready even yet to receive him into the bosom of the church and we give him sixty days to transmit his retraction to us in a writing sealed by two prelates or what will be more agreeable to us to come to rome in person that no doubt may be entertained as to his submission meanwhile and from this moment he must cease to preach teach or write and must deliver his works to the flames if in the space of sixty days he do not retract we by these presents condemn him and his adherents as public and absolute heretics the pope afterwards pronounces a multiplicity of excommunications maledictions and interdicts against luther and all his adherents with injunctions to seize their persons and send them to rome it is easy to conjecture what the fate of these noble confessors of the gospel would have been in the dungeons of the papacy a thunderstorm was thus gathering over the head of luther some had been able to persuade themselves after reuchlin's affair that the court of rome would not again make common cause with the dominicans and the inquisitors these however were again in the ascendant and the old alliance was solemnly renewed the bull was published and for ages the mouth of rome had never pronounced a sentence of condemnation without following it up with a death-blow this murderous message was about to issue from the seven hills and attack the saxon monk in his cloister the moment was well chosen there were good grounds for supposing that the new emperor who for many reasons was anxious to obtain the friendship of the pope would hasten to merit it by the sacrifice of an obscure monk leo x the cardinals and all rome were exulting in the belief that their enemy